Well, <clears throat> in the 1970s, I was working for a defence company called Sperry Gyroscope. Um, and um, M-Drive really started with, with a chap called um, Professor Eric Laithwaite. And in 1974, he gave a lecture um, at the uh, Royal Institution, Christmas lecture, uh, <coughs> in which he um, claimed that a gyroscope could be used as a thruster. The Ministry of Defence uh, suddenly got interested in this <coughs> and um, wondered if it could be used for missile control, which was the sort of thing we were working on. Um, <coughs> so they came to us to, uh, to evaluate the concept. Now, we looked at it very carefully and decided that um, <coughs> no, it couldn't be done mechanically. Uh, but I did then put forward a, a, a suggestion that it could be done electromagnetically. The uh, <coughs> um, suggestion wasn't taken up, and I moved on to uh, other work um, developing <coughs> surveillance and targeting sensors for the British Army. And it wasn't really until the 1980s when I was working on um, the Skynet 4 uh, satellite that I realised it would be ideal for uh, satellite propulsion. Once I'd convinced myself that the theory was correct, I carried out a little bit of experimentation in my garage in the traditional way. And then I explained the concept um, <coughs> uh, to my employers, who were at that stage Matra Marconi Space, Technical director um, rejected the idea outright and actually suggested that if I mentioned it again, it would um, <coughs> my career would suffer. But he lost his job after a few months, uh, and uh, I was actually informed by the French management that um, uh, they wouldn't pursue the idea, basically because um, uh, they had um, a lot of investment in the Ariane 5 um, project and they wouldn't really look at any new propulsion for another decade. <clears throat> so at this point I, I um, <clears throat> decided to leave Marconi and set up my own company, uh, Satellite Propulsion Research Limited, and along with uh, a group of long-suffering shareholders uh, we started our work on developing M-Drive. Well, we were soon awarded a grant from the UK government um, and they continued to fund this research um, the work progressed through um, a feasibility study which used an experimental thruster through to a demonstrator engine um, that could actually produce eight grams of thrust. Uh, in total, this was about a five-year program, <coughs> and we were pretty pleased with the results. Uh, so when New Scientist wanted to write a feature article, we agreed. The article was published in September 2006 and uh, caused a bit of controversy. There was a very small group of very vociferous uh, protesters and they actually persuaded a, a, a British MP to raise a question in the Houses of Parliament. Now this was a bad mistake. Um, <clears throat> the leader of this group was a guy who claimed to be an electromagnetic expert in <coughs> and he claimed he was working for the Australian Ministry of Defence. And what nobody realised at the time was that um, uh, the technical monitors on, on this job um, were the UK Ministry of Defence. So there was a quick exchange between the uh, two ministries and um, it was found out that uh, this guy was not in fact an expert. He wasn't even a scientist, he was a school teacher and he was well known to the Australian authorities for a history of, um, shall we say, strange conspiracy theories. <coughs> In fact, the question was answered on December the 5th, 2006, by Margaret Hodge. <coughs> she was then the Minister for Industry, and she provided a robust answer, which is actually recorded in Hansard. Well, I, I actually have no trouble with healthy scepticism. Um, however, I was very shocked by the level of personal abuse that came back. And indeed, uh, I still get some insults on some of these uh, internet forums. But I guess I've got pretty immune to it now and just put it down to very strange people being out there on the internet. <coughs>
Okay, in the meantime, we carried on with the work, and um, by 2008, we were involved in a number of meetings with the, um, <coughs> the UK Defence Authorities. Um, this culminated in a meeting uh, on the 10th of December um, uh, in the depths of the Pentagon, um, fairly high-level presentation. Uh, it was attended by the US Air Force, DARPA, NASA, and it was actually chaired by the director of the um, National Security Space Office. We were then <coughs> invited by Boeing to do a technology transfer um, uh, on M-Drive, and this was set up by the State Department and agreed uh, by our UK Ministry of Defence. We actually had to get an export licence. <coughs> And um, uh, Boeing offered us a small, um, a small contract, um, but this was to be followed by what we hoped would be a lucrative license agreement. <coughs> well, we designed, built and tested a flight thruster for use on a test satellite. And this thruster gave 18 grams of thrust. <coughs> we transferred all the design data to Boeing. The contract was completed in July 2010. We then waited for them to sign this license agreement, which had all been prepared by the Boeing lawyers and we'd uh, signed our part of it. Um, however, once we confirmed all the test data, uh, it suddenly went quiet and we have not heard from Boeing since then. So after the flight thruster project, I turned my attention to work on what I call the second generation thruster, which is a superconducting thruster which can give a, a lot more thrust. <coughs> um, I carried on this, with this work, but by the end of 2012, um, SPR Limited uh, started to run, run out of money and I was actually on the brink of retiring. Uh, we were then contacted uh, by a UK aerospace company who um, <coughs> wanted to um, uh, support the work. Uh, we also signed a license agreement with another non-UK company, um, all again with uh, the Ministry of Defence approval. Um, and then NASA came along <coughs> and they asked us to provide data on what was essentially our first thruster, our experimental thruster. Um, and in 2014, uh, NASA produced a paper, which caused a bit of a stir, and I'm never, never quite sure why, because all they did was produce 10 milligrams of thrust. Now, 10 milligrams of thrust is seven and a half thousand times lower than the thrust that the Chinese had produced in 2010. So if there is a race going on between uh, uh, NASA and the Chinese, then they've got an awful lot of catching up to do. <coughs> um, I, I understand there is a, another paper due out uh, from NASA in December this year, so we'll see how they've got on. The UK Ministry of Defence and the American Department of Defence are interested in M-Drive. It would clearly be very useful on any um, intelligence gathering platform uh, or communications platform. Uh, essentially, it provides good maneuverability, continuous maneuverability, uh, with stealth uh, characteristics. In particular, it enables um, low Earth orbits to be maintained, where the, um, it, which gives much better sensor resolution. <coughs> and uh, clearly, M-Drive has no exhaust signature, uh, and, and therefore is uh, inherently very stealthy. This is an early example of a flight thruster. And as you can see, it's shaped as a truncated cone. Now, what happens is the microwave energy goes in through the uh, input connector and also uh, a tuned circuit, and the electromagnetic wave propagates backwards and forwards inside the cavity. <coughs> now, the velocity of propagation at the big end approaches nine-tenths of the speed of light, 
while at the small end it's about one-tenth of the speed of light. And it's this difference in propagation velocity that causes a difference in the radiation pressure forces uh, between the big end and the small end. <clears throat> so what you have is this thruster is actually producing a force in this direction which causes an acceleration in the opposite direction. And this is just a simple example of Newton's laws. What I would say is that the idea that M-drive violates the conservation of momentum is itself nonsense. Of course it doesn't. Um, you know, it wouldn't work if it did. And it, it, so all that M-drive is, is a device for exchanging the momentum of the electromagnetic wave that's going up and down inside it with the momentum of the thruster as it accelerates. Um, it's all actually elementary physics. Um, you can derive the, um, uh, the uh, very simple version of the thrust equation from um, Newton's second law and Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. You take those two equations, do half a page of pretty straightforward algebra, and you get the equation which uh, predicts how much thrust you'll get out of this thruster. And, you know, the experimental evidence again and again shows that this equation is correct. So there is no need for any new or exotic physics. This is actually um, uh, simple elementary physics, but you need to look at it in a, in a very um, uh, rigorous fashion. <coughs> there are, at the moment, ongoing flight projects using first-generation M-Drive. And the second generation work um, that we're doing is meeting its milestones. So I would say that in the next decade, um, M-Drive technology will start to be being used all over the world. <coughs> and why, what, sorry, and um, you asked me why do you think M-Drive will change the world? Well, the most, <coughs> Okay, sorry, no. Uh, let's start again. <laughs> I think most people will only really notice M Drive um, when they can call up a personal air vehicle. It will arrive and land vertically outside their house. It will take them wherever they want to go, uh, quietly, comfortably, safely, um, uh, and they won't get stuck in traffic jams. <laughs> um, that the sort of consumer um, uh, application that, um, uh, that we're looking towards. But there will be a much more serious application <coughs> and that will be when we can use M-Drive for low cost access to space and we can start launching solar power satellites. Um, there has been an awful lot of work uh, over the last 40 years studying what solar power satellites can do and there is a consensus of opinion that this is actually the only real solution to the world's energy problems. Um, and there have been many studies. Um, the, um, the, the proposals that have been put forward are, are really um, quite mature um, and they're backed up with some hardware development. But the thing that always stops these um, proposals uh, dead in their tracks is the cost of launching the satellites. If you take a typical 2 gigawatt satellite, it will weigh 6,700 tonnes. And to get that into orbit, you would need 1,700 Atlas V launches. Uh, now, you, you probably get about five Atlas V <laughs> launches a year at the moment, so this would be a huge undertaking, um, costed at the, in the region of about $194 billion. Now, a recent um, international study has been done, uh, and it says that essentially you need to reduce the cost to about $20 billion to make solar power satellites viable with, for instance, a nuclear power station. So we did a study. Um, we came up with figures which showed that if you used three M-drive driven space planes um, for 134 launches, 
um, the cost would come down to uh, something like about one and a half billion dollars. So this is less than one tenth of the cost of a nuclear power station. And it also gets rid of the, um, uh, the, the, the safety and waste disposal concerns. So, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Once you can get low-cost access to space, then you can solve the world's energy problems. Yes, I guess my air <coughs> interest in aircraft and space travel uh, started very young. I was born and brought up in the RAF. And one of my early memories, actually, is my father sitting me in the flight engineer's seat of a Lancaster bomber, would you believe? Um, uh, and after that, I always just wanted to be an engineer. Well, a routine part of any design engineer's job is actually inventing solutions to problems. Um, and most of these inventions usually get in incorporated into fairly large systems. Um, and um, they are inevitably commercially sensitive or um, classified <coughs> uh, by the Ministry of Defence. So really nobody gets to see them, which is a bit of a shame really, because um, it, it, the, I think one of the things that my career has shown me is that um, engineering is not a, a boring profession at all. Um, uh, particularly the work that I did um, <coughs> Uh, with the British Army doing field trials, for instance, uh, on equipment, um, I got to play with the big boys' toys, you know, guns and tanks and helicopters. Um, there were some hairy moments. Um, on one occasion, I accidentally came under live artillery fire, which is a bit unusual. Um, there had been a breakdown in communications, and myself and a guy from the Irish Rangers um, uh, found ourselves flat on our faces uh, on Salisbury Plain, a few yards from the impact point um, as the rounds came in over our head. It was a fairly terrifying moment actually. And then <clears throat> in 1980, um, I was actually in the middle of a desert when the Iran-Iraq war suddenly broke out and uh, it did. It was, it was very unexpected at the start of that war. Um, we managed to get back to Amman and um, it was in complete chaos. Uh, nobody really knew what was happening. My colleague, who was um, <clears throat> an intelligence officer, uh, was actually issued with a sidearm for his personal protection. I, just being a mere contractor, <clears throat> was simply given a couple of business cards from the uh, head of the Jordanian security and told that eh, these would get me through any, any problems. Um, I wasn't quite sure of that myself because I was actually carrying a, a whole can of film in my briefcase, which uh, was a bit sensitive. But um, uh, we got out of that and it was that particular incident that um, <coughs> convinced me that I ought to take up a, a, a bit of a safer career and I moved into the space industry. <coughs> so. I guess one of the highlights there was um, uh, my work on the NATO 4B communication satellite. Um, we were asked to do uh, a very fast, very challenging program here. Um, and at first we didn't really know why, why this was uh, such a <coughs> uh, uh, an urgent um, uh, project. Um, but anyway, we, we, we got through it um, and there was huge relief once the satellite was launched. Um, we had a marvellous party, uh, launch party on Cocoa Beach. Um, and then we found out what it was all about because four days after the satellite came on station, the first NATO airstrikes went in uh, on Bosnia. And, um, and that was the beginning of the end of the Bosnian War. So um, uh, satellites can do a lot of good. <coughs> I don't think engineers become superstars particularly not in the UK. Um, we just quietly get on with our work. Uh, most of us enjoy the work and we can have fun as well. Um, and if we're lucky, we can actually um, help to make the world a, a safer and better place.